Welcome, everyone. It is the Tuesday edition of Talk Back, brought to you by Bitterroot Motors, where they've been doing it right for more than 42 years. Office solutions and services, locally owned solutions for every office. Deep Roots Medicinals. Uh, call 531-7461. And uh, also Rogers & Company Fine Jewelry, offering beautiful, unique fine jewelry at uh, uh, 3550 Mullen Road across from Super Walmart. Also brought to you by Automotive Cutting Edge at 1510 Bulwark. Call 542-2218. And by Transport Equipment, your headquarters for RV service maintenance and repair. Give them a call at 541-9097. Okay, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. It's open phones for the first half hour of the show. And uh, John King, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to nickname him King, wait, uh, LeBron John King. LeBron John King. Yes. Well, what do you know? Yes, LeBron John. I understand that uh, you had a chance to put on a show at the uh, at the Y yesterday, right? Yeah, it was a uh, man. I, I everybody now knows that I'm not a big fan of cats, but I think one thing that I'm also not a big fan of is young men. <laughs> really? I I do not trust. I have a strong bias, probably because I've been one before. Okay, but well, hold on. A I, I look at a teenager. I you, look at a teenager, and okay. immediately I like. Man, I know what's in your filthy mind. <laughs> I've you, been there. Oh, hold on a second, pal. What? You are a young man. Because well, you're talking to an old man right here. You are still a young man. Well, so anyway, I'm, there, there's lots of things that would be young. Yeah, I mean, which reminds proportionally me of, reminds me of an old Tower Power song. But anyway, go, go I, ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. like below 21. Thank you. Well, Thanks. yeah. So yesterday, we're at. I'm playing basketball at the Y. And if you've ever been to the Y, it, the basketball games, like pick, in the afternoons, games, right? they're just kind of pickup games. Right. And it's usually really nice and friendly, at least in the afternoons. I don't know. I've heard midday balls re- pretty rough sometimes. Right. but uh, And, I mean, it's a it's a big mix. I mean, there's kids that are in high school and grade school and adults. I mean, <laughs> I... Now, basketball, that's the big orange round one? That's the one? big orange round okay, one. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we're playing, and this kid comes to the court, and... Uh, at first, it's pretty cool. Everyone's nice. And then uh, someone says, you know, hey, uh, make sure you pass it around. You know, just kind of giving some advice, uh, trying to get their team to improve. And he, he's like, I don't know. I don't need to pass it around. This is Y ball. It's not competitive. And then no less than five minutes later, he tells somebody else some advice of something they should do in their game. <laughs> and what, uh, you know, some guy like me probably on his team said, hey, uh, this is why ball. It's not competitive in a kind of sarcastic voice. And the guy explodes, just dropping F-bombs and yelling and screaming. And there's a low s- threshold of uh, very yeah. low threshold. <laughs> like it went, it went from zero to 11 <laughs> in, <laughs> in like 15 seconds. And so I come over and I'm like, Hey guys, let's be congenial, okay? Congenial? Yeah. You use the word congenial? And I have no idea wow. what this guy. I thought maybe he thought I told him he had congenital herpes or something. <laughs> Cuz he blows up at me for telling him to just, you know, every and I didn't even direct it at him. I said, "Let's be congenial." Like as a team, guys. And he goes off on me and starts yelling at me, dropping expletives and uh telling me that I'm female genitalia and <laughs> Just going all out on me, and, and and he's like, "I bet you're from Montana." I was like, "Yeah, we're all in Montana <laughs> right now." It's like, "I'm from Tacoma." I was like, "But you're in Montana. I don't think the preposition really matters all that much." And he's like, "You da 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 expletive expletive." And we we play the game, and I couldn't hold myself back because we were behind by two or three points, <laughs> yes. and we came back, and the final shot to win the game was a three pointer. And everybody, uh, you know, looks at the ball and it comes down and I throw up my hands and I yell, that's two, because we were playing ones and twos. Right. That's two for Montana. <laughs> and the, the guy goes. Was not well received. The guy goes ballistic. Wow. Runs over to me, you know, like, and I, I'm like, I think he's coming to like, give me a high five. And just, right. You know, so I like put yeah. my hand out. He yeah. won't give me the high five, right? Walks right on by. So I pat him on the shoulder as he walks by. He's like, don't touch me. You want to go outside and fight? He's like, no. He's like, you couldn't beat a guy from Tacoma? I was like, I just did. <laughs> he's like, one on one right now. And so there's all these people. There's like 10 people there. Right. You know, all the people from the game, plus one or two people that weren't able to get into that game because we were picking up new players after every game. Hopefully his mommy wasn't there to pick him up. So. This guy probably doesn't have a mommy, sadly. <laughs> 
anyway. One of the problems with our world. Anyway, yeah, 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 so yeah. we I, I get roped into this one-on-one game, and it's just me and this kid from Tacoma. Right. He takes the ball out. We don't, like, check it or flip a coin or anything. He just starts with it, and he scores a point. Well, somehow, by providence, I shoot a three-pointer and make it right over him. So now, and we're playing to three points, so I have two and he has one. And, of course, I'm a female genitalia because I shot a three-pointer in a one-on-one game, which is apparently not supposed to happen. And I get belittled for this, whatever. Uh, Then I go and, uh, or he gets the ball, I steal it, and then I make a shot, so I win the game. And (laughs) he goes off on me again. (laughs) And and he just just goes off and he keeps calling me this word that I'm not going to say on the radio. Thank you, yeah, yeah. And which basically he's like, you know, you piece of female genitalia. I'm like, right. well, I just beat you. So what does that make you? What do, what does that oh. dominate over? Oh. Look, I'm sorry. I apologize if I ruffled your feathers. I don't want your apology. I was like, well, it's there if you want to pick it up. Yeah. And wait, I went on playing. Anyway, the whole night, the guy just staring daggers at me. Doesn't play any more basketball. Just sits on the bleachers staring at me the whole game. And of course, I can't make a point the rest of the night. I'm just done i spent all my mojo on that one shot but it was worth it it was a weird day so anyway there's <sighs> my there's my my epic tale of ladies uh, ladies and gentlemen old guy beats young guy luckily <laughs> this the, the, this this is the quintessential argument that you never try to argue with john king because he's usually smarter than you <laughs> And has you know the 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 thing to say that was going to make you feel like an idiot. So there you go. You way to go, John. Well, I, I hope. I wait, and by the way, way to way to stick up for Montana. Well, and way to be congenial. I was trying to stick up for Johnny. He was the guy getting <laughs> ripped up, and and also for like all the. I mean, like seriously, there's like seven year old kids out there. Yeah, you shouldn't be cursing like that. I mean, I guess there's no FCC regulations on the gym floor, but he was way over the line. <sighs> unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, it's the it's the jock mentality. Some sometimes, anyway. But but, uh, so. but hopefully, ninety nine point nine percent of the people who play at uh, pickup games are congenial. Well, this is my so you know knowing young men as I do, and and also with this experience, every time there's one of these incidences, you know these right. rape incidences. Sure, yeah. Let's. I mean, be honest with me. Maybe you feel the same way. I know you're a guy. Do you automatically? When, before you've read anything, think that the guy probably is at fault. Usually, yeah. And if there's a domestic abuse controversy between a man and a woman, don't you automatically kind of think, mm, I think the guy's probably at fault. Usually. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that sad? I don't know what to tell you. I, I, it's like, anyway. I, I, it's, 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 I, really, that extra chromosome is almost an embarrassment. <laughs> It's it's a big piece of baggage for us to carry around. It's a lead balloon. Well, perhaps it gets easier as we get older. Well, yeah, I guess so. But yeah. But and I'll let you know when I get older. <laughs> oh yeah. So anyway, we're, we're we're up against our <laughs> first telegraph break. me when yeah, you get yeah, there. Yeah, seven two one twelve ninety is our number. I'll slow down and wait for you. Put it that way. We're one eight hundred five six eight five three zero nine. Uh, well, we've got some other stuff to talk about. We've got uh, politics, and all sorts of things going on in Missoula, and we're going to come right back with more of talk back in a moment. 721-1290-1-800-568-5309. We are, <laughs> we are not world-class genetic scientists here. So. Oh, no, but uh, I yes. think that, uh, as Matt pointed out, a great evidence that you can argue with John, and okay. you should, by All calling right. 721-1290 if okay. you disagree with me on something. There you go. Uh, men do not have an extra chromosome. They have a different chromosome. They have a Y chromosome. Right. And not just two Xs. There you go. So, there you go. Okay, we feel better now. We feel, <laughs> we feel much, much better informed. But speaking of different chromosomes, obviously this next uh, big 2016 election is really kind of a gender battle in many ways. Right. Uh, you know, Hillary is really trumpeting up the fact. I mean, if you remember the last campaign, it was all, who are you going to call in the morning? Right. I'm, I'm the, guy, the gal with the experience and the trustworthiness and the professionalism, I'm running against some young buck who's barely held office and has no experience. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait. <laughs> well, that guy won. And so now we got, now, now Hillary's running on, I'm a woman, hear me roar. Right. I, I, she tried to hold a woman's only conference the other day, Yeah. Uh, but they couldn't get enough women to come, so they had oh, to let men in too. You gotta be kidding yeah. me. So wow. anyway, um, uh, one of the things that's really hurting her though right now is that people just don't trust her. 
Uh, CNN did a poll, and I actually have their their video of it up here uh, in the in the queue. Peter's it, looking. It, uh, which one? Which one is this? It is now? Poll. Poll. CNN poll. Hillary trust. Ah, uh, there it is. Okay, I got it. Okay, you want to do this now? Yeah. What's okay. the name of the uh, uh, the uh, reporter? There? It's uh, Jennifer Agastia. There we go. All right, All right here we go. This is uh, kind of interesting, I think, uh, especially if you li- listen to how. Long it's been since the trust has fallen. Okay, here we go. New CNN ORC poll, hot off the presses. It reveals that Hillary Clinton is hitting a speed bump on the road to the White House, and Jeb Bush also having issues shaking his family connections. CNN senior Washington correspondent Jeff Zelny is here to break down the numbers. Tell us about them, Jeff. Good morning, Allison. You're right. Hillary Clinton's shine has tarnished a little bit just two months after she entered the presidential race. Let's take a look at the numbers now. More people have an unfavorable view of Clinton, 50%, than at any time since 2001. And a growing number of people feel she does not inspire confidence. That's 50% compared to 42% only two months ago. And now only 42% of people say she's honest and trustworthy. That is down from 50% in March. Mm. So, Allison, it appears some of those early controversies are causing perception problems for her, certainly bringing her back from those high approval ratings during her eight years out of politics. But there are also some warning signs for Jeb Bush. More than half of people in our new poll, 56%, say the Bush family name is not an attribute, and his connection to his brother and his father make him less likely to support him. Now, this is so interesting. In head-to-head matchups with Republicans, Hillary Clinton's margin is far tighter or it's disappeared completely from only two months ago. She had a 14% edge over Marco Rubio in April, now only three points. Ooh. Her 19-point advantage over Rand Paul is now just down to one point, wow. essentially even. And her 17-point edge over Jeb Bush is now cut down to eight. The reason? Independent voters are shifting. Men have moved toward the Republican And this is all a very good reminder. We don't know what the general election will look like a year from now, but we almost certainly know this, Chris. It will be a close, close race in a very divided country. Obviously, I figured this out right away. (laughs) Okay, I did. As soon as they started talking about how all all the... It's it's a vast right-wing conspiracy, Ah. if I may coin a phrase. Well, (laughs) yeah, I'm pretty sure... uh, (laughs) Hillary coined that phrase. Actually. Yeah, I know that. But what I'm saying is, is it's obviously a vast right wing conspiracy to 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 slander the name of this fine public servant. Now, didn't she say that about that big conspiracy to out her husband? Yeah, for, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Having, it's part of the same. They, they, they just took a little time off and now they're back at work. So interesting anyway. stuff, <laughs> which, by the way, I think probably now, now, would... some, some, some say it's not a vast. It's a half vast. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Right wing conspiracy, a half vast. <laughs> My goodness. Well, um, one of the other things that came out recently okay. was a uh, right. CNN poll. Yes. Same same people that did that study that match up. Uh, they did a poll shortly afterwards, checking out the primary races. And I thought I would bring this up because my call before he even entered the race was right. that Rubio was going to be the winner of the Republican primary. Okay. Um, and you'll notice that all of the big ads, including the one we just listened to, they always. Try to, they try to pick who they think are the top two, right? And they have a dig at both of them. So in this case, it was, nobody likes the last name Bush. Wow, newfound knowledge. <laughs> and the, and, uh, and uh, nobody trusts Clintons. Wow, some shocking news, right? But you don't hear anything about Rubio. He just floats under the radar, right? Well, get this. In the, the latest matchup, he's winning over everybody. And now there's like 16 candidates. He's beating Bush. He's beating Walker. He's beating Carson, Huckabee, Paul, Cruz, Christy, Trump, Perry, Kasich, Santorum, F- uh, Fiorina, Graham, and is on top by one. I thought I, I thought I saw a poll that said Walker was uh, forging ahead in some of these polls. Well, forging ahead and being on top are different. Okay. Yeah, there's definitely. I mean, I think definitely the top. Uh, so do you think four a, or five? Do you think a, Ru- to- a Rubio Walker ticket would uh, do well? Walker was asked, who do you respect most of all the other candidates? Right. And without batting an eye, immediately said Rubio. Really? Yeah. Wow. Interesting. All right. So we're talking a little politics here this morning. It's open phones for the uh, next 10 or 15 minutes. Then I have a special guest coming into the studio. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. John's going to grab the phone because that's what he does. Because <laughs> he's closest to it. Anyway, 721-1290 is our number. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, let's go to the phones and say good morning to our friend Tyler. Hey, buddy. What's up? Hey guys, let me get over and turn my radio down with it because. You thank know, you, thank you very, very much, much. We appreciate it. Uh, Walker <laughs> was winning a PPP poll. Okay. Uh, it, 
early in um, last month. Okay, go ahead. Just Tyler. so you know. Okay. Um, so since it's open phones, I thought I'd throw this out there and see if see what sticks. But go for do it. Guys, do you guys see that um, new story about the new gun regulations that are about to come out? I I have heard something about them, but I do not know the details. <laughs> um, it's a fascinating article on uh, Drudge hit over the weekend about the new regulations, and they go, I mean, all the way to how you have to store your guns. Um, but literally on uh, Monday, the, the, the next day after I saw that report, there was another story out that said that uh, antidepressants and painkillers make you um, far more likely to commit homicide. Really? <laughs> like 80% of the population who's already, has taken one or is on one at any given point in their life. This is true. And yeah. that... Uh, if that's the case, I mean, what, what's, what's the ultimate goal? Take the guns, right? Oh, I see. Okay. So, so, so using pharmaceuticals to make it necessary for the government to protect you exactly. and come in and take your guns so you can't harm yourself. Exactly. So they're also going to remove uh, as, uh, uh, houses that are over one story tall so you can't <laughs> jump off the tall building. And they're, and they're also going to remove automobiles so you can't run into a tree. High heels are also illegal. Yeah, no high heels, uh, no no blunt <laughs> instruments in your home. Uh, everything must be made of butter. And you cannot come from Tacoma <laughs> because apparently it's very, very aggressive in Tacoma. <laughs> Uh, because obviously guns are the only way that people can uh, do away with themselves. Actually, I was reading a really funny article. Uh, it was interesting. about Vince Vaughn. You know the actor? Right. Yeah. He's in a lot of comedies. Yeah. Yeah. He's now on True Detective. Um, he said, quote, <clears throat> I support people having a gun in public full stop, not just in their home, Vaughn said. Banning guns is like banning forks in an attempt to make people fat. <laughs> uh, like to it. stop making people fat. Yeah. Sorry. Hey, Tyler, we got to take a break. Thanks for the hey. call, man. Appreciate the update. 721-1290. Craig, we're going to get you on here in a moment. We have two lines open. Open phones for the next eight minutes. We'll be right back. It's Talk Back, 721-1290. A little open phone action going on this morning. Let's get right back to the phones. Craig, good morning. You're on Talk Back. Thanks for holding. Yes, guys. Yeah, I, there are comments about uh, a Rubio. I don't think we're ready to elect two Irishmen to the presidency in a row. <laughs> what, because he's got the O at the end? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, later. That's it? Well, yeah. <laughs> That's all you got? Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, I made enough noise the other time. I got. All right, thanks, Craig. It'd be, have to be O Ruby. Yeah, it'd be, it'd Rubio. be O Ruby. Yeah, yeah. Rubio, Rubio. <laughs> if you keep going, O Rubio, 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 you can't stop. You're going to summon a demon through a mirror or something <laughs> with chant like, like that. Like banana, nana, nana, I don't know where to stop. <laughs> so, anyway. Oh, now, 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 remember, I, I made a prediction. Quite a while ago, I said that Hillary Clinton will be our next president. Now, I always follow by the caveat, I hope that's not true. But for some reason, I just think that, uh, you know, that, that line in The Matrix where the guy says, what you're hearing, Mr. Anderson, is the sound of inevitability. You know, it, it just seems inevitable. But they that lost. Some, that the somehow, lost. I, 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 but, but, <laughs> but somehow... That they're they're going to get this this uh, this lady into the White House and she's going to be the president. Tell me what your biggest reason for not liking Hillary is. I I don't trust her. I th I think that she uh, what put it this way, what has she ever accomplished that would qualify her to lead the most powerful and most influential country on earth? But you could ask the same thing about Barack Obama before he was first elected. He had done nothing. Really, uh, uh, aside from being uh, being a congressman and a one-term senator, uh, who voted present a lot, uh, mm -hmm. to you know to say I, I am qualified to be the leader of the free world. Okay, so. what about her policies? I mean, is there something that just see my biggest problem with Hillary? Yeah, I don't trust her. She doesn't like have a lot of people. She doesn't have any trust. policies. She's sure she does. She's she's she way does? left of Obama now. Okay, all right. She's been pinning, she you know, because with with Bernie Sanders on her far fringe left, right, right. Uh, she's been tacking left as well. Uh, my be my biggest deal is you know they go to the White House and they use it to increase their own personal wealth. Right. I just you don't. It's hard for me to trust somebody that does that. And yeah. the same goes for Republicans that do that too. Like this guy that's in trouble for uh, molesting a boy apparently. Right. Um. Did, is it Denny Hastert? 
Uh, yes, Denny Hastert. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you, you see someone go to Washington, use Washington, which is supposed to be the people's house, right. for their own self-benefit, you kind of lose faith. And, what, and whether you like Ronald Reagan or not, uh, it, it was impressive to me when he said that he didn't even ever take his suit jacket off when he was in the Oval Office because he had such respect for the office, mm. which may or may not be a urban myth. Anyway, we're up against a break. We have another hour of talk back yet to come. You stay with us. I will never. Welcome, everybody. Hour number two of Talk Packs underway, brought to you by the Mustard Seed Restaurant, Office Solutions and Services, Transport Equipment, Automotive Cutting Edge, Bitter at Motors, Rogers and Company Fine Jewelry, and Deep Roots Medicinals. Special guest in studio this morning, and that's John King. I'm Peter Christian. Good morning, everybody. We are talking with Jodine Tarbert. Correct. All right. Good to see you. Nice to see you guys. Now, you have you, you have an interesting business called you're the CEO of Compliance monitoring systems, okay? That's correct. So we do jail alternative programs, um, drug and alcohol testing, and other solutions out there for the courts and, and actually private companies as well. One of the things that has come to the forefront over the last couple of years, uh, I, I, was, I was in on the building of the new jail many years ago, almost 20 years ago, and it was uh, such a huge improvement. I mean, it was a vast improvement over what we had before. It was definitely needed. There were lawsuits in the works, that sort of thing. So the community ponied up, built a beautiful new jail, but now it is also overcrowded, and we're, we're uh, trying to find places for all these people. And so the the need has come up for alternative methods of, of uh, taking care of those who are violators without actually putting them in jail. So is that what this is all about? That, that is. And so we have several different programs that we do for um, different communities throughout the entire state. Missoula is our home base, but we do this in just about every county wow. in the state. So I, I, as a uh, person, I, want, I wonder why there's a need for you as a third party in the system. Why don't police departments do this themselves, that sort of thing? Or why doesn't the sheriff's department you know, have their forensic lab, have their tools and devices and things like that. Well, why, why do you come in? I, I guess I don't understand. So that's, a, that's actually a pretty good question. And in some states, um, sheriff's departments or uh, the states own a misdemeanor type of probation. But in Montana, um, that is not the case. And quite frankly, I think that there, it is so labor intensive to supervise individuals in the community. It would just be an entirely another department for that government agency. Um, the of other course, thing. Any, anytime you're talking about a government agency, you're talking about tax dollars. Correct. And people are very sensitive about where their tax dollars go. So we want to be as efficient as we can with them, right? That's correct. Okay. And so compliance monitoring systems doesn't have a budget line item um, for a, any community in Montana. And the defendants that are referred to the program um, pay for it themselves. And we work with these individuals to make sure that they, one, can afford the program and that we work within their means. But these programs are also extremely effective. I only do uh, only run programs that have a basis of, um, there's been a lot of research on them, making sure that they perform as they should. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you brought some, this is radio, obviously, yes. but we do have a photo of, of the, some of the things that you brought with you. If you could describe what these items are, that are just describe what they look like and what they do. Sure. Um, compliance might be uh, originally known as the original SCRAM provider for the state, and SCRAM uh, stands for Secure Continuous Remote Alcohol Monitoring, and it is a bracelet that is worn on the ankle and tests your sweat, to see if you have alcohol, and it actually shows the entire drinking event. So from wow. zero back to zero and all the readings in between, and we can quantify that and know what level you were at as well. How does it test you? It just judges your sweat content or what? Yeah, so we all have insensible sweat. Um, it, you know, you can think about going to grandma's house, having a big garlic meal and smelling like that for a couple days. <laughs> insensible sweat. <laughs> <laughs> so 1% of everything we ingest comes out purely through our pores. And um, uh, scientists found out many years ago that you could 
actually measure the quantity of alcohol through that sweat. Does and it, so do, they've been working on this do, for does many it, years. Does it measure the amount of Cheetos that I had for dinner? Or? <laughs> you know, thankfully not, because <gasps> otherwise we might there might be a severe jail overcrowding if there's Cheeto jail. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Yes. So now, how, how were these devices uh, developed? Obviously, this is... This is quite the scientific achievement here. It is. And and so the actual developer of the Scram bracelet was um, a gentleman who lost his best friend to a drunk driver. And this is back in Colorado. Jeff Hawthorne um, is his name. He has since recently passed away from cancer. But he devoted his life on not only developing this, but um, the manufacturers continually improve it so that we always have the latest and greatest, you know, technology out there um, testing these individuals because we want to make sure what we're doing is accurate. Hmm. I got I, I got to ask because you're kind of in that in between zone as we were talking before. You're not a member of law enforcement or anything, right? Uh, do you find that with all these new technologies that the law keeps up well with the new technologies or? Is it a constant struggle to get the law to adapt to some of the new technologies that you have available? I think just education um, with your courts and and both the defense count, uh, attorneys and the prosecuting attorneys. And the other thing about the technology is the technology needs to be tested and peer reviewed. So, um, like National Highway Traffic Safety um, Institution peer reviews pretty much anything that I carry. Uh, and it's a blind study, so we know that it meets the the minimum standards that they're going to say this works. So obviously, jail not a one hundred percent guarantee that someone's not going to escape, but it's pretty rare. It's yeah. it's really hard to get out of jail. But I, I am going to just go out here and bet that it's easier to get away from a scram bracelet and make a break for it than it is from jail. Is that true or not true? Well, it, that would be very true because scram doesn't track you. Oh, it sorry. Just, I, I assume one right. of them. I thought it had a GPS in it. No, we do have GPS though as well. So oh, okay. the we're, we're, scram we're getting to that. Yeah, <laughs> the scram bracelet is just um, an alcohol monitoring. So typically individuals who um, are otherwise a low risk but just have a problem with drinking and and doing their crimes. Can you get one of those for domestic use? Yes. And just be like, hey, honey, you wear this and we're a cool. I have a lot of um, parents who would love their teenagers to just wear one for four years. (laughs) No, no, we're we're, we're up against a break, but I wanted to ask you before we go to the break if you can answer this question. Does this have... Uh, does it transmit the data or, or do to take it off and then you look at the readout or what? How does that work? No, so the, it's tethered to them. Once it's on, it's on. And right. um, the information goes through a little base station that they have at their house through either Ethernet, cellular, or landline connection. Do okay. they come in a fashionable design? I mean, like if you wanted to get something for your hip teenager to wear to school? Well, unfortunately, no, but I'm thinking about <laughs> implementing a bling studio just for that. Oh, I like yeah. It. We're, we're gonna Let's come bedazzle right. that scram bracelet. <laughs> we're going to come right back. 721-1290. Now, uh, we're going to take a moment because this may have just flown right over your head. So we're going to come back and we'll talk with uh, with Jodine Tarbert about why this isn't costing you, Mr. and Mrs. Taxpayer, a dime. We'll be right back. And we're back on Talkback. 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-5309. Jodine Tarbert is with us, CEO of Compliance Monitoring Systems. And one of the things that, uh, when you started describing all this, one of your statements kind of went right over the top of the head, almost a throwaway system, uh, throwaway uh, statement, was that the perpetrator, the one who is convicted, the defendant, pays for this. The taxpayer does not have to spend anything on this equipment. Is that right? That is correct. So my program is completely um, offender pay. I do have some indigent programs where uh, the company itself um, donates money into my company. So compliance monitoring. So we give back about 5%. Oh, okay. um, to the different communities for an indigent program, and we encourage them to match that through some sort of um, funding. So or it's like a, munchy, a matching course. grant or something. Yeah, or not even a grant. Just I mean, but it's a minimal amount, and and there's just a few select folks who qualify for it and go through that um, low cost program. Interesting. So, um, uh, you said we had a bunch of different technologies. I assume that the Scram had everything in it. That it had the GPS, the test for how much uh, alcohol percentage you had, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not the case, apparently. So we're looking at a, what, like five different devices here, maybe just four with a charger. Tell us what uh, we got on the table. So the, I also brought a couple of GPS units as well. Um, this is a 3M unit, and it's very uh, 
been around forever. In fact, this is the original GPS. So it looks, the, the, looks like a garage door opener. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, well, uh, it, it actually might be about that size, but it's about um, 10 ounces, so it's not lightweight, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. worn on the ankle as well, and that tracks folks. And the reason why I carry this one is it just doesn't fail in the field. It it works so well that we don't lose anyone, you know. Is it hard for someone to break it off? Um, Anyone can cut off this strap if they wanted to. We get a strap alert within seconds, Mm. and then we would notify law enforcement. Interesting. Oh well. So, what so are the and other then devices here's here? the. This is um, a little bit newer GPS, which uh, is very unique. One because it has a titanium strap that can't be cut. Wow. Um, and two, it has a little uh, piece of jewelry that the victim would carry with them, so the victim would be alerted if. Um, oh, so this salient. is like a domestic abuse sort of solver. You you, you might want to think of it in those terms, but. Um, and, and that would be the first to come to mind. But yes, there's a lot of situations where you have a victim that maybe isn't even a, you know, a domestic abuse. But we can we can put zones in to ensure that people don't go into you know the house or within 500 feet or work or the gym. But we can't protect folks when they're you know in the Walmart parking lot or getting gas. And so this is just an extra. Um, reassurance for that victim that they're going to have the power to know when that assailant might be near them. Wow, that's really, really cool. I mean, especially since, especially with a domestic violence sort of Correct. situation, I mean, they know where your favorite restaurants are. They know the places you will probably like to go. And so having the freedom to be able to see, are they actually going to be there staring at me when I go in to get my fajita? <laughs> right. It would be a comfort, I would so, think. So, so really, it, it's an effective treatment uh, to keep stalkers away right. from you. Right? Anti-stalking, exactly. Right. And so um, it's one that we're just launching. It's very new technology. They just did a bunch of studies on it. It works well. We did a six-month pilot. Now, at what point At what point do the courts get involved they and say, okay, uh, 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 compliance monitoring systems has proven, has proven itself to the district court, justice court, whatever, and so now we are going to begin implementing this. What is the process whereby that, that happens? Um, you know, we just go with into the courts, um, describe the different programs, and they're free to make that referral. I okay. mean, we, we make it as seamless as possible for them to make that referral, sure. but they just refer to the, these programs. So to each of the – because we have four district judges here in uh-huh. Missoula. Do you talk to each one of them, or do you, is, is there somebody over the top of them that says, here's what we're going to do, gang? You know, in Missoula, it's a little bit more unique atmosphere than in other areas um, because the state does – or the county does pay for their own misdemeanor probation um, through another private entity. However, uh, we service most of the treatment courts in their drug and alcohol testing. And so I'm really big on sobriety and drug and alcohol testing. So that's what I do most in district court. Okay. Let's get, uh, let's get to the phones. Do you want to grab those headphones? Uh, there, Jodine. And let's get uh, John. John, you're on TalkBack. Go ahead. Hi. I would just like to know, are these devices put in play before conviction or after? Um, John, they do require a referral when it's part of a pretrial, but they are part of pretrial as well as post-adjudication. Okay, thank you. Hey, thanks for the call. So, so what, what, what does that mean? So basically you've got someone, let's say we have a situation with a high bail, but the person is able to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Highly suspect person, that's why the bail was so high. Or right. maybe a risk right. of flight sort of thing, situation. Then does the, the do they, they come to you, I guess law enforcement or the, the judge and say, this is a requirement for your bail, or how does that work? Right. So the judge would agree to, and probably the prosecuting attorney would require a condition of bond. And the, the condition of bond might be alcohol monitoring, might be drug testing, it might be GPS, um, because of the uh, what they were arrested for. And so if there's a victim out there, they want to first look at the public safety side of things and ensure that if this person is being released... We take that into consideration. Now, now, now let me ask you this. It, let's say, now I can, I can understand someone who's been convicted of a uh-huh. crime, uh, whether it's DUI or whatever, uh, saying, okay, now we have the right to make you pay for this. But someone who has been accused of a crime, who's not yet been convicted, uh, is, is there any sort of legal problems with saying, okay, you haven't been convicted yet, but you need to pay for this anyway? You know, there, there has been different, um, the Supreme Court is actually reviewing a case from Judge Wheelis out of uh, Libby, Montana. 
and there there has been discussion about that. Um, right now, it is completely okay for it to be a condition of that bond, a bond requirement. So if you want to be released from jail, you need to follow these conditions, and the technology helps us ensure that that is happening. Interesting. Uh, uh, when, when we get back, obviously, if people are paying to use these devices instead of going to jail, there's a certain amount of taxpayer money involved in putting the person in jail and monitoring them. Do you have any idea how much one of these programs saves the taxpayer? You know, it, it's different for each community, but it ranges between sixty and one hundred and twenty dollars a day per 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 device. Yes, a day. Right. Load them up. <laughs> you want to give away some coffee? Uh, yeah, I had a free GPS. I'm just joking. No, no, just no, giving no. away Rocket Coffee. Rocket Coffee from the Rocket Coffee Supply over there in the Garden uh, Garden City Garden Supply, I should say. Free coffee, free toast. You don't have to wear a scram bracelet. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to break out of jail. All you have to do is call 721-1290. No sweat. 721-1290. And if you do sweat, we know if you have eaten garlic at Grandma's recently. All right, all right. 721-1290 for free coffee. Just give us a call. Be right back. We're back on Talkback. 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-5309. Let's hear it, taxpayers. <laughs> I, I I think this is the, this is a boon. So it's one of those deals where t- technology uh, rises to the point where it actually uh, uh, you know does something really important without costing the taxpayer a dime. And we were talking about Hillary during the first half hour, and one of the things she's been uh, promoting is getting people out of jail. Now, of course, she hasn't come up with a big plan on how to do that yet, but it seems to me that something like this could kind of work. Maybe if we were using technology like these technologies to get people out it it might help not only to help integrate people back into society let people keep their jobs instead of being away from them for so long um, but also keep the taxpayer out of the mix as much because they don't have to pay for the jail sale and the monitoring and some of the struggles that would go on there i I have to ask you of of the devices um, which ones do you feel are underutilized in the state of Montana? This is your chance to kind of be a salesperson because sure. I, I'm sure you ha- you know, hey, this would be great, but people aren't using it. People aren't doing this, and I don't know why. <laughs> well, for many years, Montana was what we consider like this right to drink state. It's only been a few years that we weren't allowed to drive down the road with an open you know, can of beer in our hands um, as long as we are under the legal limit for intoxication. And so much has changed over the years. Um, The legislator adopted the 24-7 program. um, And uh, really, when Steve Bullock was the attorney general, his focus was what can we do with individuals to bring down that rate? And so I think the underutilization is really the alcohol and drug monitoring. The amount of crimes committed because somebody is high or intoxicated is very high. And so if you can it's keep them is what it yeah. is, actually. So about, you know, 75 to 80% of those. So if you can keep that individual sober, the chances of them reoffending is slim. I, I remember many years ago before modern technology took over and we have the internet and that sort of thing, I would go to the police department every morning about three o'clock and I would look at the overnight call sheets. And, uh, and I would talk to the sergeant and uh, let's say there was 20 of them. And either 17 or 18 of those 20 had something to do with alcohol or drugs. Yeah. And, and I said, what, what would happen? I'm just spitballing here. I said, what, what would happen if magically people just stopped drinking and stopped abusing drugs? And he, he thought for a second. He says, well, first of all, I'd have to give a different, get a different job because they wouldn't need me. Uh, because most of the stuff we do, especially overnight, is dealing with people who've had too much to drink or too, ma- too many uh, chemicals in their body and making poor decisions and getting arrested. So it just seems to me like this type of technology would uh, really, really help people to uh, better judge what they're going to do with their behavior. Hmm. Yeah, so. uh, absolutely. Now, here's an even tougher question. Follow up to the last one. You work in all the counties across Montana. Are some counties better than others at utilizing these devices? And what steps would you think, uh, would you recommend for improvement for the other counties that aren't? I, I believe that all counties could increase their use. Um, 
a lot of the smaller counties, you know, those judges are neighbors with those folks that are in jail or friends with the parents. And so there's always this dynamic in the smaller communities, but they love the fact that they've had no choices in the past. And now I have individuals, um, not if not right in their county and neighboring counties that can service this. I would say that the smaller communities are extremely appreciative and for the number of arrests that they have that they utilize the systems more than let's say Great Falls or Kalispell or Missoula. And when you say utilize the systems, do they have to say, okay, now you can choose to buy this and get out of jail? Is that what I mean is that Well, they just they go to the the like the client, the criminal or whatever. I don't, I don't know how to talk about the person here, but the individual that's in trouble, the defendant. Uh, the defendant. Well, it's <laughs> after the defendant. Yeah, I mean, I he's suppose. accused, right? Usually charged. Right. So they, uh, or she, I, they, some women commit crimes too. The bad guy. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, for that, for that situation, do the, does the judge make the decision on whether or not this device can be yes. used? Okay. Yes. And I'll give you an example in Baker, Montana, which is on the North Dakota border. Um, that judge makes sure that every individual is on some sort of alcohol or drug monitoring who is arrested and, um, you know, she may only have 12 to 18 individuals, but that's because 12 to 18 individuals actually were arrested if it's their second or subsequent arrest. And what happens when the monitor goes off? So the monitor doesn't actually go off and alert you like, oh, we know you're drinking. It just takes your readings continuously. So every 30 minutes, it takes a reading. This is for the scram bracelet. That information is downloaded once a day and uh, somebody who's way smarter than us is analyzing that <laughs> back in Denver, Colorado. They give us a abbreviated version of it so that we can go to the courts and say, yeah, this person is doing great or, you know, this person didn't. So this so this is a nationwide program, it basically, in, in which you are an independent entrepreneur uh, as, as a distributor, right? Correct. That's really cool. Now, now how many you, – you were telling John and I during the break – the, uh, you you uh, a pretty good size small business, right? I do. I have about um, uh, thirty seven employees throughout the state, and um, we all operate together. You know, we work as a big team so that individuals can be mobile from community to community and still be under supervision. Okay, we're going to take a little break. Come right back, Mike. We'll get your phone call on just in just a moment. We'll give you plenty of time to make your make your uh, point. And we have two lines open at seven two one twelve ninety. We'll be right back. This is Talk Back, and it's Tuesday, and uh, we're talking with Jodine uh, Tarbert, who's the CEO of Compliance Monitoring Systems. We've got folks waiting to visit with her right now. So, Mike, you're on Talk Back. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. I'm, I have two suggestions. How about um, adding a shame factor into it by uh, painting, them, painting these devices neon pink, um, enlarging them as collars, and uh, prosecuting anyone that uh, sells them alcohol or provides them with alcohol, and that way their neighbors and friends all know that they they've been in trouble with alcohol for a while, and maybe that will shame them into fixing them. And then my second suggestion is making a military grade version and giving inmates in Guantanamo uh, tracking devices that they get to wear around their necks and put a little small explosive device in it that if it's tampered with, it. Uh, it just eliminates them, or if they go into a war zone, um, it, it detonates. But just just some helpful helpful right. suggestions. Uh, that would have been useful for the Taliban five that we released. Hey, thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I guess their stay was recently extended by yes, uh, a little by, a little science fiction factor <laughs> thrown in there. Actually, so. you're not the only one thinking up new ideas here. Uh, okay, Claire right. on Facebook says the compliance monitoring systems. Uh, why stop with DUI criminals? A great idea would be to use it on our elected officials. We could hear all their conversations when they leave home and do the people's business. So, I, I got to ask, clearly you've probably thought of other technologies that you would like to see. What would Inventor uh, you come up with? Well, your initial thought about having one bracelet that does it all would be fantastic because right now we have, you know, a myriad of of different programs and all of that takes training, certification, and a lot of time invested with each employee to make sure that they can operate that system um, uh, up to standards. So that would be my my favorite thing, although that'll probably never happen because um, like Mike's wish, it would be so big that people might need a cast around their leg <laughs> but, to get it. The technology is getting smaller every year. So it's possible. I mean, we could 
I mean, I bet you in 10 years, yeah. people are paying to monitor themselves on their Apple smartwatch or whatever yeah. company comes up with it next. Well, they, they do have, you know, different breathalyzers than that in your cell phone and, and the smartwatches that you can test yourself. But I would not I would not yeah. say that that is accurate because yeah. most of them are not all that accurate. Now, let me ask you this. You, you, you said the, the user has to pay for this. Mm-hmm. Are we, do they pay full retail or is it a sliding scale? So, how, how does that work? So we just charge one price for the program. Compliance Monitoring Systems makes the investment into the equipment, which is not a small cost. How um, much? Give me an idea for a scram bracelet. So those actually cost $1,500 um, for just one scram bracelet. And then we charge a price per day for somebody who is on it um, for an active you know, supervision. And that's it. They just pay for that active supervision price. They don't have... Um, some sort of other so, monthly fee. So, or so it's not like else. a rent to own after a year no. you own it. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, how much does it end up costing them? So uh, different programs range between, uh, you know, uh, for drug testing, because we have a full forensic lab, um, we, they pay per test. Um, in cases that, uh, like house arrest, um, which is home detention or GPS, that is a price per day and it can range anywhere between eight dollars and thirteen dollars per day depending on the level of supervision and the risk and the type of program that they're on okay it's eight to thirteen dollars per day to use the bracelets Mm -hmm. it's a hundred fifty dollars per day to put them in jail why don't the counties just pay for the bracelets for everybody that, that isn't considered a flight risk or you know some kind of um, extreme threat to civilization. I just don't think that that is where our um, laws are at right at this time. Um, they do, they definitely do utilize it for those that aren't going to pr- have such a risk in society. And uh, some people just need to be in jail. Look, I, I, I don't disagree. There yeah. are definitely yeah. people that I don't want to see on the other side of the bars. Right. Uh, one of them, I want to see them. You know, many of them should die. Frankly, that's John's position. Uh, but you know, if you're at Sarnayev murderer. I, I don't think you need to see the other side of the prison cell until you're dead. But when it comes to the issue of these bracelets and the law, you said that the law was not up to that point yet. But do you think it should be? Oh, yeah. I definitely do. I um, went to a convention in Colorado, and there's this judge who um, was also in a district attorney in a state. And she said, you know, one thing we have to remember is lock up the ones we're afraid of, supervise the ones we're mad at. And so to make that differentiation, and plus the individual needs to also probably be in some sort of treatment program if they have an alcohol or drug addiction. So there's more to it than just, oh, you're going to wear this bracelet and comply with the law. There's uh, a life-changing factor. And you had also mentioned that before you just strap, the, you don't just hand them out and say, just put this on your ankle and we'll see you later, right? There's a little bit of counseling that goes along with that, right? We ensure that the individual is screened for their um, level of risk in the community, and we address that with the individual. Um, when they walk through our doors, we believe that everyone's going to be successful unless they prove us differently. So we treat people with respect. Um, and, you know, if you treat an individual as if they're going to be successful, the likelihood of them being successful is there. Our our, um, compliancy rate is about 85%. Do you have psychologists on staff to judge the flight risk deal? I do not. So we use um, a standard uh, screening mechanism that uh, most community use. It's a Ohio risk assessment. (laughs) Okay, we're going to come right back. And Dave, I want to give you plenty of time to make your comments. We'll be right back with you. 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-5309. Or you can make, like Claire, make your uh, suggestions on our Facebook page. We're coming right back. It's the Tuesday edition of Talk Back. I'm Peter Christian. That's John King. And uh, joining us here in the studio, we have Jodine Tarbert, who is CEO of Compliance Monitoring Systems. So let's get right back to the phone. Uh, Dave's been waiting quite a while. Dave, first of all, thank you for your patience. You're on. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, since you're touching on the subject of compassion a little for these folks, I mean, I've been a dry alcoholic drug addict for 30 years. Um, thank God. But for those people out there that are addicted, who a lot of them just, for some reason, can't stop their abuse of drugs or alcohol, I think, you know, the, the monitoring is a good thing. I think we need to protect society. I've been on both sides of the coin. I've been a victim. Um, I've had a son locked up for years. 
I've lost a daughter in a car accident because of what we think is drug abuse. And somehow they need to come up with a way to actually help the people. I mean, locking people up, monitoring people is part of it, but somehow they got to help the people get to the cause of their addictions and help them stop. I, I don't know if that's possible. I mean, there's a lot of expense involved in all of this. A lot of these people get out of jail. They're, they have no money. There's, there's no way for them. The courts force them to pay fees that they, they can't get a job. They can't pay it. Then the family has to pay for all these things somehow, you know. So it becomes a burden on them. So a lot of times families are bankrupt emotionally and financially through all of these things. And, and all we see is courts, fines, lockup, jail, death. So I don't know, is someone going to think about some kind of grant money to, to help people, grant money to help people? Because most of these people really don't choose to have these lives that are all messed up. They're, they're, they're addicted. It's a disease. And so I, I, I understand the side of the people that have been victims and have been hurt, and, and, and I understand the anger there. But then again, the other side of the coin is you, you have to have some kind of compassion for these people because it could be you, it could be your brother, it could be your father, it could be anybody. Sure. Well, Dave, actually, Jody wanted to comment on that. So go ahead. You would please yeah dave thanks so much for calling and i agree with everything you said you. and one of the for your call go ahead one of the um things that we actually have here in town are treatment courts and so the treatment courts are uh, a group of highly skilled individuals overseen by a judge um, and these individuals go through treatment um, there's sobriety uh, which is enforced by monitoring or drug testing and they come out of it um, a, a completely different person. Um, one of the treatment courts that I want to touch on today is veterans treatment courts. So we have individuals that are so, uh, I'm, I'm just going to say, for lack of a better word, damaged. Um, psychology, you know, psychologically, when they come out of combat or even some of the non-combat veterans, um, and, and their resources to help stop that pain as drugs and alcohol so um, our veterans court accepts 10 people in at any given time um, the program's about 15 months um, and during that time you're going through a lot of different treatment and um, that it, sobriety it, takes effect and people get jobs and they go back to school and you know their lives it's life changing for them and and it's actually overseen by a court right right and so um, district court judge um, Larson oversees all of the treatment courts, and Judge Desmond is the judge who actually handles the um, veterans treatment court. I, I spoke with Judge Desmond uh, a couple of years ago uh, when I had a family member who was having similar problems, and she recommended one of these treatment courts, and uh, it's it, it totally an eye-opener for me because even though I'm pretty well connected in the community, I thought I knew a lot about what was going on. This was totally new to me, and it just sounded like a great program. Yeah, it, and I would recommend um, there is a screening process for it. You may not qualify, but if you have um, somewhat of a criminal history and addiction um, and you're a veteran, there's you know a possibility that you could be screened to go into this. Um, a couple of the things that you know the community could do to help out is the veteran courts needs mentors, and these mentors are trained. It's uh, 18-hour um, a year training uh there's one medium uh, meeting a month, but those mentors are the ones who really encourage that sobriety and help these veterans through some difficult times. And so um, if somebody wanted to be a, a mentor, they can contact me at Compliance Monitoring Systems and, uh, you know, I'd be happy to pass that information along. Interesting. I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about 24-7 sobriety program. It's something that goes on through the state. I, I think we did a story on it not too long ago with the Attorney General, actually. Um, I was hoping you can kind of talk about that. I assume you work with it. Yeah. So we are the provider in a lot of the communities. Unfortunately, Missoula does not have a 24-7 program running at this time. Um, uh, the former um, sheriff uh, elected not to do that, and, and this is a program that is um, – sheriff run i mean the sheriff gets to elect how to kind of run this program within the constraints of the law but 
uh, essentially twice dailies are done. Twice dailies is a breath test done in person. So you're looking at this person in the eye. They show up during a time period, let's say between 6 and 8 a.m. and 6 and 8 p.m. Um, if they test positive, they wait 20 minutes, we retest them, they test again. Um, compliance just calls a uniformed officer for them to come down or in some areas, uh, we just file um, a violation with the court and then that individual has to go back in. You and do see this the judge. at your forensics lab? Well, so our forensic lab is a drug testing lab. It, it's not like a alcohol. Well, we do do ETGs, but this is something else. Okay. So we do this in Flathead County and Ravalli County, and also um, we'll be starting in Lake County here. So basically, the, the offender has to get in a car, mm-hmm. go to the facility, whether it's the jail or the detention center or whatever it might be, uh, between 6 and 8 in the morning and between 6 and 8 at night, no matter what, seven days a week mm-hmm. and do this, right? Right, and provide a breath test. Um, and they pay for it. Right. The cost <laughs> is, the state uh, cost on this is $2 per test. Um, and uh, actually, the if somebody lives too far out or let's say they have a job where it would preclude them from making that time period, then the scram bracelet is the other alternative. Okay. Well, we're going to take a little break. Go ahead, John. Uh, when we get back, my big question on these it seems to me that there's going to be incidences because they cost money that people that have money are able to utilize the devices, but people that are poor, um, maybe higher chance of having the need for them, uh, won't be able to get them. Is that something you run into from time to time? Oh, yeah. We'll talk about that when we come back. Hey, we're back on TalkBack 721-1290. Just a few more minutes left in our program talking with Jodine Tarbert, CEO of Compliance Monitoring Systems. Now, we just brought up something. Uh, the fact that since these things do cost money and uh, people who have means are probably better able to afford it, those who don't have any money, what do they do? Typically, an individual, um, a judge may lessen their bond requirements so that they can afford initially to get out on this program. Um, what compliance monitoring does is we work with different uh businesses throughout the community that have low skill, no skill for that person who might have problems getting a job. But I can tell you once they're sober, um, they become much more bored and uh, they tend to want to go out looking for a job. So it's a rare occasion where an individual doesn't find a job in a short amount of time. Um, Back in 2009, when the economy wasn't so great, yes, that was huge. And uh, I ended up paying for literally uh paying for these individuals um but that's why i have now that five percent back so we can have money set aside to for those individuals um we we talked a lot about the benefits of these programs but surely there's some risks um right uh, if you're in jail you're certainly not going to reoffend. right what is the percentage of reoffense in montana from your experience i can only speak for for my program um but I can tell you that in my program, we have about an 85% compliancy rate while somebody is on the program. So if you've got 10 individuals and eight and a half of them are doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're going to work, they're, they're obeying the laws, and you only have to focus on that one to two that really are, are giving you heartburn, you know, um, maybe those are the ones that do need to be put back into jail. Because if they can't, follow very precise orders from the court, then they are a risk to the community. And those are the ones we do need to incarcerate. In, in my conversations with the, the various sheriffs that I've had a chance to deal with over the years, uh, a, a chronic common problem is jails overcrowded, got too many people, not enough mm-hmm. beds. Uh, not only that, but, but there are people who are arrested chronically who have mental health problems who come into the jail and they can't go in with the general population because they could hurt themselves or or or, the, mm-hmm. or, or others uh what do you do with them where do they go uh, there, there's all sorts of problems that those of us in the general population we don't even think about because we right. don't see them and and but when, when you're in law enforcement you deal with this day to day to day it's a chronic problem and uh, you, it's almost like you have to keep building more and more and more and bigger and jails, and, and uh, there's got to be a way around that. And, and a lot of that has nothing to do, I don't think, with monitoring. It has to do with treatment. There is a co-occurring court, which is people with uh, uh, diagnosed mental disabilities and also addiction, but we also have a huge homeless you know, population who has um, 
addictions and, and mental illness. And, and I think that there's a whole group of individuals studying that and trying to have um, this problem taken care of, but it's a 10 year, you know, over 10 years, we're going to take care of this problem. So sure. I don't think that will yeah. ever go away. And that really is on law enforcement to ensure that they're protecting the average, you know, citizens that are trying to walk down this the street having coffee. Well, not not only that, it, it's uh, law enforcement needs to protect themselves. I mean, they're, they're in in some ways these people are a danger to the people who actually work at the jail. You know, I mean, I mean, I I, I can't comment because I'm not in the jail, yeah, Peter. Yeah. But and and I think that you know our law enforcement does a fantastic job in this community, um, both the police department. Because you live here in Missoula, right? Yeah, yeah, I do live here in Missoula in the sheriff's department. I believe that. Um, uh, the sheriff that we have now, TJ, is is really looking at some of those other options out there um, for jail depopulation and giving it some serious thoughts. So he's looking at the community as a whole and really getting um, individuals from other resources to try to help him with this. Well, jail depopulation is crucial. We're at capacity and have been for some time, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so our uh, do you know if the county is investigating and u- utilizing your devices more frequently? You know, I think that they are. They definitely are. And um, there's also other programs in the works um, to help this out. I know that uh, County Commissioner Rowley, um, she is working on a grant specifically for, you know, to, to help for jail alternative programs. Right. I, I remember, because uh, I used to work with the uh, drug and alcohol task force for teenagers and 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 they would talk about what is the actual cost of a dui well you know it isn't just getting pulled over and being embarrassed i mean you're going to get arrested you're going to go to jail you're going to lose your license you're going to have to pay you know long term much higher insurance rates you may lose your job if you're convicted of a dui there there are some jobs you're not allowed to have anymore Mm -hmm. like if you need a state license to do this or that sometimes you can't qualify for state license anymore because you've you've got a DUI but if you add to that this type of uh, uh, this type of expense then the cost of doing things of breaking the law becomes even more egregious so think about it don't do it right right I agree I mean don't drink and drive don't commit other crimes but it's easy for us to sit here and say that but yeah, yeah, the fact yeah. of the matter is is that's why I'm in business right so it's a like football game think about this program okay <laughs> so anyway what about recidivism after the program? Is it better or lower recidivism rate than regular jail time? Uh, so uh, recidivism rate, that's a good question, too. Um, if people are on some of these monitoring programs where there's actually been studies, there is a significant reduction in recidivism. It's a measurable amount. And without, um, it, they definitely, you know, people who have addictions, up to 75% recidivism rate. Yeah, I mean, even with just a monitor, there's a sense of self-control, of you driving your behavior. Whereas in jail, you don't have any responsibility for keeping your way, your, yourself away from booze. The bars do that. Um, so I can see how that might improve recidivism rates. We're almost out of time. How do we contact you to get more information about this? Sure. Our number here in Missoula, uh, 406-529-1789. And um, you can just ask for me. I'm, I'm very available and I can communicate with anyone. Got a website? We do. It's uh, just HTTP Compliance Monitoring Systems.com. Perfect. Very cool. Thank you so much. Thank you guys very Appreciate much for you. having Th- me. Thanks for all you do. All right. It's great. Keeping us a little bit safer. All right. What's coming up on tomorrow's fabulous program? We'll have tax wonk Walt Carroll oh, on I love the show. It. Yeah, Walt, Walt has a little extra time now that uh, tax day has passed, but lots going on with the IRS. There was a huge hacking incident. We'll talk to you tomorrow.